Yeah, this is an anthology of um, pop art. It's called, it's called Popsy, which is a kind of a pop word. A popsy used to be a young lady. And uh, these artists, some of them I've met. I met Andy Warhol a couple of times. He really wasn't there when you met him. He, I didn't even realise he was wearing a wig. This is Mondrian, who would have hated pop art, but he's uh, represented here by a Patrick Hughes screen print of a rainbow invading Mondrian's um, puritanical attitude, you know, black and white and the uh, primary colours. And this is uh, Jeff Koons, rather, and I've put it standing up against, leaning up against the sky, because after all, underneath it all, I'm a sort of surrealist. This is Keith Herring, whom, of these artists, I knew him rather well. I knew him as a student, and we once went to uh, CBGB's, the Rock and Roll Club, and I said, would you like to come in? And he said, well, I can't afford it. I said, it's only five dollars. He said, no, I think I'll go home and work. He was very studious. And it's all couched, of course, in reverspective, which is my, my part in it all, in that when you move past it, when you move up and down it, it appears to move with you. It's, it's moving. I like to make it because it comes alive, I believe, with your movement, the, the joy of making reverspectives is, it's an artist's dream really to make things come alive. And in my view, as you move back and forth and as you watch these cut-in books that describe all the artists, uh, in it, there's Jeff Koons' name and Warhol's name and Herring's name, that also, instead of being as it is a cave, appears to be a promontory. In order to make things in perspective, I have to have uh, lots and lots of information. So all these bricks here, each of these bricks is saying, I'm going over here, I'm going over here, I'm going over here. And so you believe it and you think they are, although in fact, they're coming out. So uh, a graffiti art is good for me because it's walls. And um, walls are good for me because we all live in walls. We're all hidden behind these walls. We, we, we sleep uh, in, in walls underneath ceilings and floors. All that construction, all those boxes that we're in are um, part of how you make perspective work. And then uh, with regard to Banks' own work, he's a wonderful um, sort of liberal gardenista, isn't he, roughly? And uh, this is a, a picture of um, a meat wagon containing all those poor stuffed animals that are going to the abattoir. And uh, here, uh, um, some poor child is uh, making Union Jacks uh, very cheaply in India. And uh, here, um, uh, a policeman has got possession of a Jeff Koons dog with a, a wire mask on. And uh, as regards um, making it, what one has to do is you've got to select here 10 or 15 images and find ones that are uh, funny and joyful and uh, uh, intriguing in, in various ways and, and nod to uh, lots of his interests. And uh, then you have to uh, design the shape. This is a longer shape than usual, a panoramic shape, which is good for my movement across uh, things and up and down. And uh, then you have to uh, draw it all out and paint it all out. It's all drawn out and painted out. And then it has to be printed and made up in 3D and then retouched. And then in the end, you've, uh, so you've got something where you can enter Banks' world and move around in it, I hope. Venice is a terrific subject for me. There are several reasons. One reason is, is the lagoon, that madly enough, it's all built in the middle of the sea. And the fact is that the sea, water, the lagoon is fluid. And I want that kind of flow as we move past it. So at my buildings, the Venetian buildings, the Venetian palazzo, can move across the water just the way you move across the water in uh, Venice uh, with a Venice gondola. And uh, that's one of the virtues. Another virtue is because it's all built on piles banged into the mud, it's typically the same height. So these, this building here is, is four stories high, this building is three, and most buildings in Venice are four or five stories high. So there's that unity along the top. Whereas if, if, if my top wasn't so 
precise as this, it would be all up and down. So this makes this box of this um, um, Naples yellow palazzo in the middle, that can move and turn around with you. That's one reason. Another reason is that everybody likes it, like you say. And in a, in a sense, it's because it's a cliché. We know it's a beautiful old place and uh, you've got to revitalize it, revitalize it some way. So you've got to bring a new look to Venice because uh, it's been there a long time and you've got to be refreshed with it. So one of the things that I say rather harshly is I'm an expert in revitalizing cliches because perspective is now a cliché. You know, in, in the early uh, 15th century, it was a great invention and now you can have it on the back of a colleague's uh, Kellogg's cornflake box. You know, it's quite an ordinary thing and everybody knows it, but the time to invent it, the, it was invented more or less in uh, 14 uh, something, you know. And uh, nowadays we all, we all know it. And as, as I said earlier, the camera knows it intimately. So uh, given that um, Venice is uh, such a known thing, which a cliche is, and given that perspective is such a known thing, you have to turn it around. And what I've done is actually turned it inside out and uh, brought it back to life. And it, again, I'd say that you can in that way bring back that life-like visit we make to Venice where everything is moving and everything is uh, telling us so many things. You know, all these balconies are saying, we're going this way, we're going this way, but they mislead you. When Alberti codified perspective in the early 15th century, that was a remarkable moment. And there are artists like Piero della Francesca and Uccello, who famously was devoted to perspective. There came a time when all these things were known. And then in Cubism, Picasso and Braque said, let's look at the representation of space again. And let's look at it as Cubist and d deriving from Cezanne. They began to look at it fresh. And de Chirico, in the Surrealist period, made other inventions and did perspective all wrong. And uh, then uh, Escher came along and did uh, uh, work with perspective in an absurd and paradoxical way. And I see myself as part of that tradition, if you like, of the op artists and uh, Escher and de Chirico and to some extent the Cubists and then going back uh, to the Renaissance. I think it's all part of a, um, a, 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 the artist's interest in space, really. We're terribly interested in the, the space of things. And in a sense, sculptors are interested in space, obviously, because they make things that invade space. But, but painters are very interested in space to somehow create it. And my pictures are halfway between paintings and sculptures, because they're paintings that have been pulled out uh, as, if, as if they were made of chewing gum, you know, they've, they've been made 3D, they're low reliefs. People sometimes ask me, how different are the Riva Spectres from the Rainbows? They both begin with R, but they're quite a different world. But there's a sense in which they are the same world, because the rainbow is an illusion. It's the light from the sun, diffracted and diffused by tiny spherical globules of water, the rain, and we then see all the colours of the spectrum in a bow. But each person does see it absolutely differently. It's an illusion that we see. And we can photograph, but it comes and goes unbidding. We, don't, we can't call it up. It just happens. Oh, look, there's a rainbow. And that strange coming together of uh, uh, rain and sun, sun and rain, rain and sun. So here I, I've, I've done about a hundred rainbows. And I thought I'd left it behind, but I've returned to it in recent years. And of course, God doesn't make uh, half-hearted things. God makes complete circles, you know, not, not just the rainbow that stands uh, at the uh, horizon. But he may, when you go up in a plane or go to Victoria Falls, you see that it is in fact a complete uh, circle, or torus as it's called, like a donut. So here I've done it. Um, the rainbow and the reflection, the rippling reflection of the rainbow. And I, I wanted to say, I'm not sure that anybody really understood what I wanted to say, 
But I know that rainbows um, can't lean up against walls and can't have cobwebs on them and can't uh, dangle a palette from them. I know they're not real, but I pretend they're three-dimensional and real and throw a bit of a shadow and uh, I, I make out that a rainbow is a thing. But there's a crucial point there. We often think that uh, events are things. Do you know, our love for a person is an event, it's an ongoing relationship, but we treat it as if it was a thing, a marriage, you know? And so you know, a, a play is something that you travel through, or a book is something you... A book is a thing that's almost, I was going to say, it's made of wood, it's paper made of wood, and you open it and put it down and so on. But it's not a thing, it's an experience. And so what I'm trying to say is that rainbows are actually experiences. You can't, you can't nail down an experience and have a cobweb on it. You can't have an experience that you can dangle all the colours of the spectrum on it. You can't have an experience that you can uh, uh, penetrate a couple of clouds like two lovers. So I, I, was, I was trying with a sense of irony to say, you can't send a rainbow in the post. You know, I did a marvellous one where I had a rainbow in brown paper wrapping with sealing wax and string and so on, and it was just poking out. You can't send a rainbow in the post. It's not a thing. It's an ineffable experience.